views expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of WPSL. However, we're the ones who've encouraged you all along to like and share them on social media and with all your friends and neighbors because if it's happening on the Treasure Coast, you'll probably hear about it on the Sue Ellen Sanders Show. And right now, it's time for the Sue Ellen Sanders Show. So here's your host, the one and only Sue Ellen Sanders. Welcome to the show, and uh, we try to bring you information that is useful to you living on the Treasure Coast, and and today is no different. Um, One of the things I like the most about the Treasure Coast is how well the different agencies partner together to create um, fun events, educational events, uh, learning events, giving events, and today's event that we're going to be talking about, um, we have Ken Joelli, right? You got it. It's a tough yeah. one. Yeah. Well, it, as long as I stop trying to pronounce it the way I think it is and do it the way that it is. So Ken Joelli is an extension agent with IFAS and he is partnering with the Oxbow Eco Center um, to bring a special event to you, to people on the Treasure Coast, and um, it's called BioBlitz. And also yeah. joining me for this show is Jake Sanders, who's going to be uh, handling co-host duties, and he's collected a little bit of, uh, of things that are going on uh, across the Treasure Coast too. Um, Thank you first for of all. Me. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, Ken, um, what does an extension agent do? What don't we do? <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about me and who I am and what I do here locally. I grew up in St. Lucie County. I We moved here when I was a child uh, back in 1984. So I grew up and went through school here. And I'm very familiar with St. Lucie County's natural systems. The beaches, I spent one too many hours, to be honest with you, on the beaches in my youth. And I'm very light skinned and fair skinned. So I've had more than my fair share of sunburns. But I've been stomping around the woods and the trails and the beaches of St. Lucie County for a very long time. So I had an interest in this. I had an interest in learning more and more. So I went to Indian River Community College at that time, but it's State College now, got my associate's degree. And then went off and got my teaching degree at UCF, and I taught school biology for one year. Um, you know, God help teachers. I, I decided to remain sane. I got a job, and this was a decision I had to make, though. I, I got a job working for the University of Florida Extension locally here in Fort Pierce, and I earned my master's degree. So what an extension agent does is we are basically the front door for the University of Florida here locally. So each county in Florida, and we have 67 counties, and we also have some um, some reservations where we have extension agents stationed. But each of the 67 counties in Florida has an extension office, and we have the ability to create programs, educational programs um, that are University of Florida research-based programs and help meet the needs of the community. Uh, here in St. Lucie County, I do natural resources, the environmental work, I do more than my fair share of work with things such as water quality. I do work with pesticides, but not quite so much anymore. Invasive species. Uh, you might have noticed the agama, those, those redheaded lizards all over town. Mm-hmm, well, yeah. You know, the 10, 15 years ago, those weren't here. So, you know, we actually, I can remember, I was calling them rainbow agama lizards for a while. And that's because we had students at the University of Florida that I was working with um, that actually had to do the research to figure out what they are. So now we know that they're not what we originally thought they were. So, you know, we're here doing educational programs. I have colleagues that work in um, community resource development. Uh, They might be helping somebody that has debt problems or maybe some um, basic skills like using checkbooks and things like that. Um, Credit cards are always an issue. Uh, We have somebody that works in our 4-H program, and John Ferguson, he's fairly new to our office, but we have a huge 4-H youth youth program here in St. Lucie County. And, you know, it's uh, when I think of 4-H, and I was in 4-H when I was a kid, I remember, you know, I I think of 4-H as like the livestock 
folks, the people that raise the pigs and, you know, the chickens or whatever, bunnies, whatever it might be. But we also have a lot of other things that are going on too. A lot of homeschool kids in our area are also in our 4-H program and they they use our um, UF research-based science information to get the uh, the kids trained and skilled. Um, so we have that. We have people working in horticulture. Uh, somebody is working with uh, fruit crops, especially, you know, citrus is uh, one of those struggling industries right now where we have researchers that are uh, working very hard on coming up solutions to issues like greening and 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 that, which is you know harming our local industry. So we have an extension agent who works in those sort of issues, and then we have somebody that works in um, both urban and commercial horticulture. So you know we we're spread out all over, um, and then we also have Sea Grant agent. I don't want to forget our Sea Grant agent because he's working multi county, so he works quite heavily in marine areas. So um. So That's you do, do everything. <laughs> well, we, you know, the thing is, is we try to, we, we're, we're an agency that listens. And when we listen and we have formal ways of listening through advisory committees and things like that, but we listen. And when we hear a need, then we create an educational program. If it falls within the extension umbrella, you know, so we don't help people with like dental issues and things like that. But if it falls within some sort of a, agricultural or biological or life science sort of realm, um, then we see if we can help. So those are the main categories, the life science, biological, and ag, because I thought it was straight up ag. I didn't realize that it was more than that. And of course, um, you know, the the nice F Florida logo in the background of your, your video is, a, oh, right um, yes, <laughs> and um, <laughs> there it is. Um, the, the scene from campus. Um, I'm a University of Florida journalism grad and oh. um, everyone in my family, you know, has been uh, all for the Gators for many different reasons. And um, we used to um, go back and, and uh, find out about different things like uh, a lot of times I would have Anita Neal um, oh, come yeah. and talk about uh, the, what was going on ag-wise and the programs and the summer camps that were offered for kids oh, that was discovering land and sea. Um, and then, you know, then I was exposed to those 4-H programs too that some of the kids in the neighborhood were doing. Um, and the lessons that they learned from that is that's like a tremendous uh, opportunity for kids to grow and learn and nurture and and um, find their voice um, through, you know, 4-H. Um, so, so what you're doing, uh, partnering with the Oxbow, yeah. is this something new or is this something you've always done? So I've been getting more and more heavily involved in the technology end of uh, biological sciences. And the University of Florida, they like it when we kind of push the cutting edge. So the BioBlitz concept, we're going to be using an app called iNaturalist. And so I've got my little cell phone here. And, you know, this little cell phone, it's hard to believe how much power is in this cell phone. Everything in our lives seems to somehow be tied into the cell phone that we have. Um, you know, I was thinking, I was reading an article the other day about the Voyager spacecrafts. We've got two of them out in the farthest reaches. I think they've actually gone outside the solar system or getting ready to go outside the solar system. And they've been flying since the 1970s, the late 1970s. There's more power in my cell phone than there is in the computer systems in those robotic spacecraft millions of miles away. So we can use this power, This uh, we can empower citizens to use this to help learn about the environment. And um, there's an app called iNaturalist. We're gonna be asking people to download that app and I'm gonna teach people how to use this during our program on February 1st at BioBlitz. The very first part of it is gonna be an orientation. And when people log in and they to the iNaturalist project that we've created, it's the 2024 Oxbow Ecosystem BioBlitz. When people log into that and join the project, then every photo they take on site will have the geospatial coordinates associated with it. 
they upload it to the app and it shows us exactly where it's going to be at Oxbow. So, you know, people go, well, one of the questions we sometimes get, well, what if I don't know all the plants and animals? Well, that's fine. We really don't need you to know all the plants and animals. The only thing that we ask people to do is when they find the picture, when they take their pictures, either identify it as a plant or an animal. You know, we've got fun. That should be pretty basic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be. But then we also have some people that are, you know, the whizzes that get out there and they know, they literally know every plant and animal. So I'm I'm hoping that we can kind of not have so much um, hesitation with the, the, you know, identification of the plants and animals out there. Because as part of the power of this, people will take the pictures using their cell phones. It gets uploaded automatically to the app once they join our project. The geospatial coordinates are located on the map, so we know exactly where it is that people have seen the plant or animal. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, people all over, anybody with internet access can find out about this project, join in from wherever they are. They, I've had people, um, I've got a class coming up. Somebody has taken the class from Toronto. We could have people all over the world, literally with internet access, and they can help us do the identification. And they, they're they called verifiers. So what they do is they see the observations popping up in iNaturalist, and then they'll chime in real fast, and it happens real fast. People will see it, they'll chime in real fast, and then they'll be able to help us do the ID. Usually it's a genus and species. Um, you know, People sometimes get worried about, as long as you know it's a plant or an animal, we're good with that, we can work with it. And we'll be able to get quite a few of those observations up to we can, what we consider to be research grade. Um, so basically this power is gonna allow us to take a biological inventory of the Oxbow's property. Wow. That's really like a, a crowdsource trail guide kind it's of. It's exactly the crowdsourcing. And you know, it, the thing about it is the genus and species intimidate people. So, you know, I could say Talantia recurvata, I will see people's eyes glaze over. They won't know what it is that I'm talking about. But if you can say ball moss, you know, that's the same thing. Yeah. But with iNaturalist, what we've noticed, some of these names, th these common names are kind of weird. So, you know, they'll come up with some common name that we don't ever call it here in mm -hmm. Florida. They might call it something completely different in Georgia or Pennsylvania or whatever. And um, as long as we can get it to the genus and species with the help of those verifiers, um, we're good. So can people like Jake download the app now and start to see what is like? Do they need practice? They need practice. But one thing I've done is I've created a, I don't want to like over speak on some of the terminology on this, but I've created a geofence around Oxbow. So what that means is that we're controlling the observations in iNaturalist. So I'm limiting it to certain, I'm limiting it to plants and animals. I could tell fungi, I could put bacteria, you know, fish only, whatever it might be. And I'm also putting it only within certain time frames. Mm -hmm. And I'm also putting it only within the parameters of the Oxbow's property. So anybody during the time frame of our program, of the event on the first, anybody who's on site can upload those photos and get those, you know, get the inventory, the observations started. What is the purpose of doing this? Just to get a count? It's to get a count. It's to get citizens involved in this. Uh, some people want, some people just want an excuse to go out and look at nature. I mean, right. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be honest with you. I was out eating lunch in a parking lot at a local nature preserve. And I was sitting in my car listening to the radio. And first thing that came to my mind is, why am I sitting in my car? It's 65 degrees out. It's beautiful, sunny. I need to get out of this car and go for a nature hike. So if we can get people out, you know, getting the exercise, the fresh air, uh, I think that's a good thing. Get people reconnected to Florida. So this is going to take place February 1st between 8.30 and 11.30 on Saturday Correct. morning? Uh, it's not a Saturday. It is, I believe, oh. I believe it's a Friday. Okay. Um, I would have to check on that. Yeah, but we'll, we'll we'll check on the 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 date on that. So, but it's February first. It's, it's a Thursday. Thursday. It's yeah. February first. It's Thursday, February first. Okay. Well, that should encourage, especially some of the homeschool families, to come out there, um, 
is there an opportunity for um, kids to to participate on field trips to there? Certainly. Yeah. Yep. And what they should do is they should just contact me. Yeah. And I can work with our 4-H groups. Uh, so the one thing that's really important is they need to have access to a cell phone. Right. And, you know, kids, sometimes they have cell phones. Um, but as long as they're with their parents, they can get out there and just take a bunch of pictures. That's basically what they're doing is they're taking a bunch of pictures. Uh, some people have specific interests. Uh, some people only want to see the butterflies out there and they'll follow butterflies all over the place. So that's great. But some people want to see everything. So the option is up to them. Well, um, I'm not sure exactly where we want to go next. I know there's a lot of different programs that IFIS does that you can talk about too. And then um, we could also talk about some of the different programs that take place at the Oxbow. Um, so let's start with you, Ken, about some of the other programs. And I know, Jake, you have the information pulled up too. So if you have you have any questions you want to ask Ken about the programs. You said the different extension agents handle different types of programs. Yes, we have different audiences. Um, my colleague, Amir Rezazade, Dr. Amir Rezazade, he is a fruit crop, fruit crop specialist. So he would be tied into the local needs of the people raising citrus, or maybe they're doing mango production or you know whatever it might be. And so we have different audiences that we reach out to. So, yes. And um, then the people that are handling marine life, then they do things that are specific. What are some of the programs that are coming up that people can participate in other than the bio blitz? Well, I actually have one other bio blitz that I'd like to plug you right do. now. Yeah, okay. and this is not the only one. This is going to be a local one. Um, Yeehaw Junction is not that far from us. No. And it's a 45 minute drive, maybe at the most, up the turnpike. And, you know, the University of Florida actually has a satellite location right there. Um, Yeehaw Junction, you wouldn't realize it, but we have got something called the DeLuca Preserve, the UF DeLuca Preserve. Mm -hmm. And the story behind this is um, there were two people that started Subway Subs. Okay. One of the people who started Subway Subs was the original owner was Mr. DeLuca, owned the DeLuca Ranch. Mm -hmm. And he passed away, but he left the, the fam, the wife, his wife is still there. Um, she's living nearby. But for the wife to maintain the 50,000 acres or whatever it is, you know, on site, it's a huge piece of property. It was a little bit overwhelming. So they bequeathed that to the University of Florida. So one of the things that UF asked us to help out with as an extension agent, they asked us to do um, biological surveys of the site. So this is our third year where we're going to be on March 1st, we're going to be doing the DeLuca BioBlitz. And um, we got sponsors for this so people can register for it. Uh, we do hope that people come with some background knowledge of plants and animals. Um, you know, master naturalists and so forth, master gardeners. Um, we've had 4-Hers get involved. People with Audubon might have an interest in birds. And then what we do is we send them out onto the site in four-wheel drives and send them out to the various corners. And they will start the biological surveys using iNaturalist. And the property is so large and it's so remote that telephone signals are actually a little bit difficult. Internet ac accessibility is not really that great. But what people can do is they can take photos using the iNaturalist app, take photos of the biological diversity out on site. And then when they're in some place where they have Wi-Fi or where they're reconnected to the cell phone, all those photos get uploaded to iNaturalist. So we will really literally have in one day in a matter of six, six or seven hours, we'll probably have a thousand observations done on one property with all the biological information associated with that. So that is going to be very much of an extended bio blitz. Um, so really what you're talking about with the February 1st one that's local at the Oxbow Eco Center, um, that's kind of a baby bio blitz compared well, to the one on March 1st. Well, in a way it is. And really it's, it's my- smaller. 
yeah, it's a smaller one. It's really my job to kind of help bring people in. So, you know, I'm teaching people locally um, what we're learning and what we've done about the BioBlitz and DeLuca for now our third year. It's just a lot of fun. So we're hoping to engage people. And it's really my job to be bringing that that sort of program home to St. Lucie County. So not only can I help UF out with this semi-local BioBlitz and DeLuca up in Yeehaw Junction, 45 minutes away, but I can also bring that sort of program here locally, which is exactly what we're doing. Do people have to register for the local program as well? Yes. And uh, there is, if you go to um, our blog, and I'll send you our blog, it has all the information. We do have a $10 charge. We're asking for a $10 charge for this. And that's because um, we're having to buy safety vests and some other things, you know, waters and some other things for people. So we are asking people to um, to please, you know, pay the $10 for the registration on that. And we'll mm -hmm. split that, you know, whatever proceeds are left over, we'll split it with Oxbow and Extension. But I'm guessing there's probably not going to be much. So what is the benefit to the people that will be part of the bio blitz? I know you you all are getting an inventory out of it. What what can uh, the people that are coming out? Is it kind of like real life Pokemon Go, right? Uh, it kind of is. And I mean, they're getting out there. They're learning about the plants and animals on site. So, you know, more than likely, people are going to be kind of on their own doing their own kind of observations, but they'll learn about the plants and animals, common names, genus and species. I'm guessing that by the end of the day, they're probably going to be able to find out exactly what plants and animals are there for their own knowledge, their own self-improvement. So it's a little bit different way of teaching. Uh, you know, as a teacher, you know, I've got a formal teaching background. We learned about different ways of teaching and learning and there's something we have called Bloom's Taxonomy. So what we've learned through educational theory is that you can enrich, you can make a very enriched experience for somebody by getting them more and more engaged. Mm -hmm. If somebody is in a classroom passively learning, I could show 40 slides of plants and animals, you know, usually it's just one type of, you know, either plants or animals. And Research has shown that really only three or four of those things that I've taught people are actually absorbed and, and created permanent knowledge. If people take a role in getting out in the environment, seeing it, taking pictures of it, learning the genus and species, learning the common name, it's just a deeper, richer educational experience. And it contributes to um, biodiversity research, not only through the bio blitz, you know, the, the information that we collect, but it also goes into... Um, the BioBlitz um, database in general with iNaturalist. How many people is there a limit to how many people that you can uh, take at the Oxbow event? Well, we're aiming for about a dozen. So hopefully a dozen to 20. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that'd be a nice, comfortable amount of people. And we'll see how it turns out, you know, as, as far as, you know, I've done these before. People sometimes don't really completely understand what they're getting into. They think it's going to be like a guided lecture where I'm going to point out every single plant along the way. It's kind of almost like a delayed educational experience. They're going to get out there. They're going to see all the plants and animals out there. They're going to be taking pictures. And then the crowdsourcing in the background, they're going to be getting all that information for later consumption. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, and, you know, I, I relate to what you're talking about with the engaging during teaching um, because even as an adult, we are so much like that too. Um, show me, don't tell me um, is how I understand 60 years later. So I, yeah. I can understand how that works. We have um, something in extension called death by PowerPoint. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's, it's awful. And, you know, I sincerely appreciate teachers trying to teach people new information, but when you have PowerPoint slides that have 50 words on it and you got 50 of those slides, people are not really, there's really very little engagement. So like you were saying, you really need to kind of learn by doing. Right. Um, Jake, are, are you familiar enough with the Oxbow programs where you could speak to um, 
some of the uh, Oxbo events that are coming up as well. I, I know, know you go there. I know they have regular um, kids events that uh, are every Saturday. Um, so every Saturday they do uh, pop up nature events at twelve thirty, and they do uh, feed in the critters at uh, one thirty. So. Uh, if you've got kids, they're free. They're no registration required. It's a really cool, fun, fun opportunity. Um, it's always fun to go out there. And I think one of the things that people that participate in your program, Ken, are going to find is it's a different uh, visit every time you're there, uh, depending on what the weather is, depending on uh, what the weather was two days ago, depending on what time you show up. I've been there. I want to say probably somewhere between four and 500 times the last two years. Right. And over the course of those times, I've seen, I've seen gators, I've seen bobcats, I've seen wild hogs, I've seen, right. But not every time do I see every animal like river otters and all the different things. It really is that I can count on a single hand, the number of times I've, I've bumped into a wild hog. Right. And that's always an experience. I have had feral oh. hogs stand their ground against me in places like that. So <laughs> me you know, too, any, with, with three dogs with me. <laughs> and so anytime I go on any sort of nature hike, I always carry a good walking stick with me. And that's because I want to be able to put something between me and whatever might be on that trail. And I always try to make a little bit of noise out there. I don't ever want to walk up on a feral hog and kind of spook it. Um it's better that they hear me and kind of get out of the way for me. So, you know, I've been working with the Oxbow since, well, since they first opened all those years ago. I've been an extension agent since 1993, and I've been doing a lot of programs. I do bat detecting with them from time to time. So what that means is I will go out with groups of people at night, and it'll be hosted by the Oxbow, usually in October when we have Halloween in mind. And we'll use these little echolocation, uh, these little sonar detectors that can hear the bats if they're within 60 feet of us. And so we'll just take people out on the nature trails, listening for the bat echolocation. And it's always a hit. We always have a good time. But you're right, Jake. We don't always know if we're going to get bats. We don't always know exactly what kind of bats we're going to get. I think out of all the times I've been there, I've only seen the bats once. Um, and that was when yeah. the bats went down. Yeah, well, the one time I was out there with the bat detector around the bat house, I didn't actually find a bat in it. I found a flying squirrel. <laughs> really? So we should rename it the flying squirrel house. Now, that's something I have not seen yet. Yeah. Uh, the um, the bat house up in Gainesville the at on the University of Florida campus is something Three that of them now. Oh, there are three of them now? Because I know that when people are visiting up there, for whatever reason, you go at, at sundown at a certain time, and then you stand there and wait, and then you see all the bats go from point A to point B all together. Um, is that similar to what is going on with the bats in St. Lucie? No, it, it, our bats here behave a little bit differently, unfortunately. We do have some bat bridges in St. Lucie County, and I've taken groups of people out to the bat bridges, and I can tell you that what they do is they kind of wait. So if you look, um, there are some I-95 and turnpike overpasses in the more rural areas of the community, and they have little expansion joints that the bats kind of squeeze up into. So we might have you know, a few hundred thousand bats living in a bat bridge in St. Lucie County, but my experience going out to the bat bridges, they will drip out one at a time. It's it's not like a large, you know, flock of bats coming out like we would see at the bat house in Gainesville. They kind of kind of come out a little bit at a time, and um, and then go foraging. And the bats here, by the way, that we've got are um, obviously they're nocturnal, but they're all insect eaters. So you know, there are some misconceptions. People think that bats here eat mosquitoes. They really don't. Um, when you get up to Gainesville, the kinds of bats up there, they have mosquito eating bats up there. Down here, the insect eating bats we have are looking for moths and beetles and things like that. So th there's a little bit of um, knowledge that comes along 
with each of these field trips and site visits that I host. And uh, as far as the, the field trips, can somebody bring an idea to you and create the partnership? Or are you like open to new sure. adventure? Sure. Seems like that kind of job. I mean, you kind of have to, you know. And, you know, so I, I'm, I'm teaching right now, starting up on, on Friday in two days from now, I'm starting up a Master Naturalist Conservation Science course. And this course is pretty intensive talking, it's an advanced course, uh, talking about biodiversity, the diversity of living things and the threats and, and some of the decisions that, get, that can be made to help solve those problems. And um, we're going to be taking people on um, kayak excursions, and we're going to be bio blitzing at the Savannah's Recreation Area off of Midway Road. We're going to go out to um, Lakeside Ranch Stormwater Treatment Area that's run by Audubon of Martin County, and we're going to show them all the migrating birds that are in the area. So it's a, it's really, I have a great job to be honest with you, because I get to see all this amazing nature as part of my job. But if I'm not aware of what natural features are available, then I kind of might miss it. So I just happen to know the folks that work at um, Audubon of Martin County. And I know that this time of year, we have the white pelicans that visit there near Lake Okeechobee. We have roseate spoonbills and so forth. So I'll partner with them and they'll host us out there for a field trip. Um, but you have to kind of hear what's going on. You have to, I'm always listening. And as far as uh, the different classes that you're describing, are those classes that are open to anybody? Yes, they are open to anybody. The conservation science course, that one, the registration is closed on that one um, because it's starting up in, in less than two days. Uh, but yes, it is. They're adult education programs. And um, I've got another program coming up. It's called Freshwater Systems. And it's the Florida Master Naturalist Freshwater Systems course. And um, people will learn about the plants, animals, and human dimensions in Florida's freshwater systems. And that might be the springs. It might be um, lakes and, and things like that. So, and the neat thing about it is this is a statewide program. The Florida Master Naturalist program is a statewide program. I'm just one instructor, but I might have partners in Gainesville that might host me for a field trip to the Springs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have done that before where we've had people going up to Gainesville to camp out and, and see Itchituckney and so forth. So it's really a, a pretty good opportunity for people, especially adult learners that really want to learn about Florida's environment. The, the one uh, program that I was familiar with as well is the Master Gardeners program. Yes, and Anita Neal, who you had mentioned earlier, uh, I actually started a few years before Anita, and I remember her as a new agent back then, and she was running the Florida Master Gardener program way back, I think it was like 1995 or 94, whatever it was, and um, she was so successful at it that she became the director here at the Extension Office and then went on to become our, our University of Florida district director. So she, she's able to nurture the Master Gardener program, not only locally, but also throughout all of South Florida. And um, not only that, but she can also work with all the other programs that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, so th tell us if people want to find out more about what IFIS does, is it sounds like you've kind of got a finger in everything that is part of nature. Yeah. Um, so the best thing to do is to go to a search engine and just UF extension. That's it's as easy as that. And maybe put the county that you're in. But we do have a website. And in our website, we have a calendar of events. And most of the agents will put their calendar of events. Um, will will contribute their programs to that calendar event events. And then we'll be able to find out about things that way. And, and people can access it, and most of them are open to the public, depending on the age capabilities. Yeah, I mean, everything we do is, you know, we're a publicly funded entity, so everything we do is open to the public. And um, we don't, you know, we've got, you know, programs, that we don't have any reason to not be open to the public. You know, we want people to come and use our programs. And we want success stories. What what is the basic connection with the University of Florida and the programs? 
I mean, to begin with, the University of Florida was an ag college. It still is. It, it still is. And the University of Florida is what we call a land grant university. And it was founded to be one of the two land grant universities. The other one is um, Florida A&M in Tallahassee. But we are the traditional land grant university for Florida. And we're located in all 67 counties. There are land grant. I think there are land grants in every single state in the United States. And um, what we do is we basically bring the University of Florida's knowledge and research-based information to the local communities. And I'm considered faculty at the University of Florida, but I spend my time here. And um, the, the nice thing about this is if I have to meet a local need, if I have requests for something locally, and I might have colleagues somewhere in the University of Florida system, I can ask them for help. I can go, for example, uh, my colleague, um, Steve jo Johnson, Dr. Steve Johnson, is an expert on these non-native invasive reptiles. His, um, his email is tadpole at ufl.edu. So he's reptiles and amphibians. He's the guy I go to. When we started seeing all these redheaded agama, those, those lizards walking around town, I went to him immediately. And the two of us started doing work to figure out what was going on. And then what we did is we had students engaged in it. Uh, we had to come up with some ways to trap and manage these animals when people requested it. And then we published our findings, not only just in um, research-based publications, but also in our EDIS documents to make it more available to the public, more palatable to the public. So we're not throwing statistics and all that other stuff to people. Um, within the last two or three years, we've been getting a lot of people asking us about the the brown basilisk lizards. And these are the lizards, we call them the the Jesus lizards. The ones with the, the they're one yeah, color. They all, yeah, but yeah. they have the, They have they, a crest on the top of their head. Yeah, 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 yeah. And when you're near them in fresh water or maybe even in estuarine systems, if they're spooked and trying to get away from you, they have the ability to propel themselves across the water. And they all these things oh. originated from the pet trade. That's the novelty, you know, of having these brown basilisks. The novelty is that they were able to run across water. So some of them got away and now they're living in the environment. But the question is, what are they doing to the Florida environment? And there are questions about whether or not they can impact human health. I am working with people at the University of Florida, Florida Medical Entomology Lab in Vero Beach, who have some real concerns about them being able to transmit and harbor um, these zoonotic viruses, these, these viruses that come from mosquitoes. And if that's the case, we need to be on top of that. We need to get Florida, you know, aware and engaged in that issue. So research is ongoing. I have to know who they are. I need to know who these researchers are and where the research is leading them, what conclusions they're, they're meeting. So yeah, there's a lot to learn. It's a constant learning curve in this job. What about the iguanas uh, falling from trees during cold snaps? Which it's ones true. are those? It's true. And I can actually call them invasives. So I'm very careful with the language that I use. Um, with the brown basilisks and the agama, I call them non-native lizards because we haven't yet been able to figure out exactly what harm. We know that they're probably doing harm to the environment. We don't know exactly what's going on with them. With the green iguana, we know that they are invasive because they're able to transmit salmonella to people. Their droppings on fruit and vegetables could tra be transmitted to people and cause foodborne illnesses. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know we're able to call them invasive. And by the way, we will see iguana here. And they do drop out of trees when we have cold snaps. Mm -hmm. And we... There are brown iguanas and there are green iguanas. In St. Lucie County, by far what we have are green iguanas. And even if they look brown, <laughs> they're green iguanas. It, it really, this is where the common names kind of throw people off. Did the colors change based on the season? No, not really. There are just some that have a brown color form to them. Um, okay. Sometimes they, they will shed their skin. And, you know, they'll get a little bit of a milky appearance to them. Um, sometimes they'll just look like their skin is sloughing off. Um, but we have 
green iguanas, and then we have brown colored green iguanas, just like we have green anoles, which are our native anoles, those little lizards that are native. The green ones are the natives, but we have a brown color of the green anoles. Green ones. <laughs> It's like, so if you're not a scientist and you don't study them, these differences may not be apparent to you, um, but it could affect your health. I mean, it could affect the future. Yes. And yeah, it may not affect your everyday life, but you end up with salmonella or you end up with, uh, right, being sick because of some of these uh, mosquito-borne illnesses, right? Yeah. That's exactly it. So, you know, the, the University of Florida, these researchers, the PhDs, I have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. I have colleagues here at Extension that do have a PhD. Um, they specialize in some very complicated research. I mean, I have one specialist that I work with that specializes in algae. And he has to know how to do genetic analysis and test for toxins in algae and see if genes are turned on and off. I don't have time to specialize in that just that one topic. That's why when I come up with um, issues that need to be addressed locally, if somebody is having an algae issue, I can reach out to them for help. You have a specialist um, in, in all situations. And then you can reach out. So each county has yes. extension agents and an extension office, but yes. some agents cover more than one county. Correct. Um, our Sea Grant agent, uh, Dr. Vincent Encomio, by the way, he works both in Martin County and in St. Lucie County, um, doing marine science and, and Sea Grant work. My colleague, Dr. Amir Rezazadeh, he's in St. Lucie and in, in River County, and he does work with fruit crops. Um, Jake, uh, you come from a non-scientific background, but you're very much into nature. Uh, is, is this the kind of thing that you would go do? For you know? sure. I think this is, is something that really targets like a, a group. I, right When when the Pokemon Go fra K fra uh, craze was out there in the world, I was out there uh, doing that. I, I did geocaching at one point with, with a friend, right? So I think if someone has an enjoyment of that type of thing, if you maybe... Uh, don't know what you're getting into at the Oxbow and this is a good like first way to go try it out right I, I think is a a great answer right you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that Pokey Go that Pokemon Go that was out was it like five years it was pre-COVID it was like five or six oh, years. Well, yeah it was huge then I, I there's still a group of people that are out there doing it right I, I so there have been some issues that have been brought to my attention that you might not be aware of there have been people that created, what is it, a pokey station, I think is what they might call it. At the space, and then they're trying to get there after hours, I'm sure. So what's happening is I've had reports of people doing like gopher tortoise burrows with, you know, active gopher tortoise burrows that have been turned into the a pokey station or whatever. Oh, my God. It. And so people will kind of swarm there all of a sudden and get all of that uploaded, and it creates a real disturbance. So... Yeah. Yeah, well, no, that, that one I'd probably report and deal with, with the 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 folks from the uh the uh Google, right? Because I think they, they run it. Yeah. So so February first is we just have another minute or so. Sure. Um sorry, our, our time got a little off today with a, a little bit of a uh rough start, but um February first is the uh, bio blitz that's at the oxbow eco and it's a good introductory bio blitz uh, for people who want to come and be part of the crowdsourcing the inventory of the uh, you got the uh, language down yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but um you can look up the IFIS extension or the BioBlitz. The Oxbow Eco is located just across from the St. James Publix, right smack in the middle of St. Lucie County. Um, but you do need to register for this if you're interested in coming. Um, Oxbow has a ton of different programs that 
for homeschoolers, for field trips, for people, and they have paths open to run or walk on um, or take dogs on at, at any point. Um, also, IFAS has a lot of different programs that are different types of naturalist programs, and you can get all that information by checking out their website. Um, Ken, is there anything else you want to add before we go? We just got a few more seconds. Well, I just appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Sue Ellen, and thank you, um, Jake, for inviting me to do this. And I wish Kiersey could have been with us today because I'm sure she would have had a lot to share about the Oxbow's programs. But we hope to see a lot of people out on, on February 1st. And you can even come and watch if you don't want to participate and then participate in the next one as well. Uh, we'll ask Kersey to um, come do a show with us and talk more about the Oxbow activities as we, we move forward in the year, especially with uh, Earth Day coming up on April 20th. Um, Jake, thank you for joining me as well for the show. I appreciate your your uh, insight, millennial insight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Ken, uh, again, the the you have a website with all the information on it. You also have social media. Um, it's lucy.ifis.ufl.edu. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you both for joining me today. And thank you for listening. Um, if you've got stuff that you want to share about St. Lucie County and the Treasure Coast, just reach out to, uh, to WPSL and uh, let us know and they'll get the information to me. You've been listening to the Sue Ellen Sanders show and I'm here every week with more. Um, where we look forward to seeing you uh, next week as well. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, thanks again for joining me. We'll talk to you soon. With archives on YouTube under WPSL TV, The Sue Ellen Sanders Show, weekend mornings at 7.05 a.m.